Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have two hours of horror stories as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. But of course, only if you feel that this video is genuinely deserving of it. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as I do post content just like this every five days. Anyways, sit back, get comfortable, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I collapsed onto our couch in the living room. It was a Friday night of a particularly strenuous week, and I was determined to celebrate. Unfortunately for me, my roommate had invited over about a dozen of his friends for a little party and pregame before they went out. I can't remember what their plan was exactly. It had something to do with bar hopping. All I knew was that eventually, I was going to have some quiet time to myself in the apartment. That is, if I didn't decide to join them. The thought occurred to me that I should check my assignments. I wanted to be sure I was done for the week, and that I could finally just kick back and relax. Upon checking, it looked like I had everything submitted. But before closing my laptop, I heard the faint sound of the Discord notification over the blasting sound in the apartment. Someone pinged me in the group chat, the chat that my friends and I used to stay in touch, as most of us live nowhere close to each other now. It's more accurate to say that its purpose is to send stupid memes to each other above everything else. What's up? I sent, hoping to spark a conversation. Not even a minute later, I received some friendly name calling in return. Their messages put a smirk on my face. Just staying in. I'll probably be in voice chat later if y'all want to join. Maybe we can play something. Unannounced. A few other replies that they would be there, including a couple of friends who rarely joined the voice chat. Another pinged me asking if I would join, as I hadn't said what I was doing yet. I sighed as I sat back, looking at my laptop screen. A part of me considered going out with my roommate and his friends. After all, I had just turned 21, and I wanted to get out of my shell a little, but I also knew I wouldn't have another opportunity to join this many of my own friends for games for a long time. I also knew that if I went out, I would get bored easily and quickly, and rediscover that bars are not my idea of fun. I sent my response in the group chat. Alright boys, I'll be there. Immediately, my friends added reactions to my message and sent overly dramatic messages to show their enthusiasm. Once everyone decided on what time they would be able to join, we narrowed down our list of games and decided that the first few of us who got on would start with a few rounds of Phasmophobia. After all, plans seemed to be established. Everyone returned to using the chat to post memes. Realizing I had a couple of hours to spare, I joined my roommates and their friends at the kitchen table. I didn't know a few of the people there, so I made an effort to introduce myself and make conversation, but being the introvert I am, I found myself walking away and checking my phone more than talking to anyone face to face. Most of the time, I was checking the group chat and the various memes being posted. During one of these little breaks from being social, I saw a new link that hadn't been embedded as any image or video. The most annoying memes are the ones that don't embed, or can't be viewed unless you go through the link to whatever app or site it came from. This link, in particular, looked off. I couldn't make out the name of Amy, and it looked like nothing more than jumbled letters and numbers. Even weirder. The person who posted it didn't have a name, and the user avatar was just a default one. I was fairly certain no one with access to the chat had a blank profile. After a moment of hesitation, I tried to open the link but it, whatever it was wouldn't load. I wrote it off as my phone acting up, but curiosity quickly got the best of me, and I felt an urge to know what it was. I retrieved my laptop, 
opening it again on the living room couch. To my confusion, the unorthodox looking link from the nameless, faceless user was still there. I again hesitated before clicking on the link again. A full screen window appeared, quickly loading a grainy black and white video of an empty room. I realized my error in not checking the volume beforehand because apparently I had it on max. The annoying sound of static disturbed the music coming from my roommate's speaker. A yell came from someone at the kitchen table in response. Turn that off! I frantically tried to turn down the volume on my laptop, but it didn't seem to work. The static remained just as loud. I tried to alt plus F4 the window, but it refused to close. I tried to open other windows. I even tried to shut off my laptop entirely. Nothing was working. As the mysterious, blank video continued to play, one of my roommate's friends drunkenly walked over to the couch and stared at the screen for a minute before asking, What are you watching, dude? I don't know, man. One of my friends sent a link to whatever this is and I'm trying to... Just hold on for a second. I replied, uninterested in explaining the situation while trying to fix it. My roommate, Alex, walked over and sat next to me on the couch, along with another one of his friends. What's this? Some old movie or something? It looks creepy. Alex inquired. I have no clue. I'm trying to shut it off right now. The window won't close. I can't turn down the sound. I can't open anything else and my laptop won't even shut off. Well, just let it play, I guess. Alex suggested, so I let it be for the moment. Another minute or so of just the empty room passed by before a figure walked into view of the video. The few of us watching went silent as we observed and waited. The man who had walked in front of the camera was very well dressed. He wore a very old-fashioned looking suit. It looked like something from the 1920s maybe earlier. I don't know all that much about suits. On his hands, he wore black gloves. This is all we could make out because his face was out of frame. The camera must have been angled poorly because we couldn't see anything above shoulder height. He walked into the center of the frame before standing square facing the camera. Though the audio was coarse, his deep, soothing voice was heard clear as day. Greetings. And welcome to the seventh installment of this series. I'm your host. Before the man could speak his name, a wave of static violently washed over the screen accompanied by even louder white noise. After a good ten seconds, the video returned to normal and the man continued. I advise that all watching are sure to have seen our past works, particularly installments one, two, and four as they detail how to locate and acquire a proper subject. This is paramount information to have before proceeding with this installment. By now, the music in the apartment ceased and all of Alex's friends crowded around the couch to get a look. As many of you must know. The man in the video continued. The old markets are gone, and the farms have died out since such a time when this commodity was abundant. We have no choice but to seek out and harvest it ourselves. What's he talking about? asked one of Alex's friends, before being hushed and told to shut up by everyone else. A few of them whispered comments to each other, most pointing out the weird camera angle excluding the man's head. Along with the acquisition and proper preparation of subjects, the processing is equally important, and the last step necessary to enjoy your hard-earned goods. Future installments will explain the process in greater detail and complexity. This film seeks only to demonstrate the most basic processing techniques. The screen once again became flooded with static and blaring white noise before cutting back to the film. When it did, the suit and man was no longer alone front and center of the video was someone new. Another man dressed in a suit, though his was much more modern. His head was also above the view of the camera, 
Something about him felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. At least not until I heard a gasp from behind me. Then I saw it too. The man was hanging. From what, we couldn't see. But his lifeless, dangling feet held over a wide metal bucket. On the floor beneath him made it clear. Everyone else must have noticed as well as some began whispering concerned comments back and forth. Others hushed them in response, eager to see what would happen next. I stayed silent, believing it was nothing more than an act. The man in the old suit walked into view again, dragging a cart with him. It immediately became clear that he was quite a bit taller than the man hanging up next to him. Their shoulders appeared to be about the same level, but the feet of the man who was hanging lightly swung back and forth in the air, at least a few feet from the ground. Some commented on this, but fell silent as the man began to speak again. I have here a subject for this demonstration. Those of you who have seen our past installments may recognize it. The harvesting process may be done when the subject is dead or alive. Of course, alive can be much more entertaining. Unfortunately, our subject here put up too much of a fight to do this demonstration alive. It is especially important not to damage any of the more valuable pieces while acquiring a subject. Before you start, have something to serve as a collection bucket for the blood. We don't want one of the best parts to go to waste. Most of us watching remained silent. Some felt suited to laugh at the absurdity of the dialogue, but the ones who did were silenced as the towering man raised a knife from the cart. First, we opened the chest. He plunged the tip of his knife into the hanging man just below the neck, though only a couple of inches. He pulled the knife down effortlessly, tearing through the man's clothes and the man himself like butter. Along with it came the grotesque sound of flesh being ripped and bones being snapped. He returned the knife to the cart before placing his hands back in the man's chest. In one rigid motion, he pried the man's chest open. Everyone around the couch, including myself, recoiled uncomfortably upon hearing the insufferable noise. Blood gushed from the newly made open cavity in the man soaking his clothing and collecting in the bucket underneath. My roommate Alex quickly got up from his seat, expressing his disgust in the process. Some of the others turned away and covered their eyes. I, like all the others who were still watching with intent, thought it was all an act, reasoning that it must have been some sort of prop corpse, with prop blood, and now we were looking at prop organs. And now... We harvest the goods. Express the man who seemed to be acting as a butcher. Letting the organs marinate in blood enriches their flavor. He announced, grabbing a smaller blade from his cart. For the next several minutes, he removed organ after organ. Heart, liver, intestines, everything. He carefully lowered and lightly dropped each organ into the pool of blood collecting in the bucket somehow remaining to still keep his head out of view. Everyone remaining on the couch began to leave one by one as the video went on. Some even gave me disgusted glances as if it was my fault that they saw what they had and could have warned them. I think some even got the idea that I watched these kinds of disgusting things in my free time. I hadn't met most of them before, so it was certainly a bad first impression. I remained on the couch, though I lost attention to whatever you might call that video. After several more unsuccessful attempts to shut it off, I set my laptop back on the table and resumed messing around on my phone while it continued playing in the background. Well, I'd like to say I lost attention, but it would be more accurate to say I couldn't bear to look at the screen. Still, enough curiosity remained for me to not walk away entirely like the others. For the next several minutes, the man continued his disassembly of the corpse. Though I looked away for most of it, I could still hear everything. Clothes were cut, followed by flesh, 
Bones were snapped, joints disconnected, and blood continued to trickle into the bucket on the floor as the man's calm voice detailed exactly how to follow along. I loosely listened along to his reasoning behind keeping each limb intact while I checked back in on the group chat on my phone, curious to see if I could find out who the unnamed account that posted the link was. To my annoyance, the message was no longer there. When I texted my friends, questioning them on the matter, none of them knew what I was talking about. I was the only one who ever saw the message. By this time, most of my roommate's friends were putting on their shoes and using the bathroom as they waited for their Uber rides to show up. I figured now it was a good idea. I decided not to go with them. A few of them glanced over at me in disapproval as they headed out of the apartment one by one. Others just turned away. I can only assume, judging silently. Once everyone cleared out and it was just me left, I walked into the kitchen to clean up the mess, most of which they neglected to pick up themselves. All the while, the video of the ridiculously tall man cutting up a body and narrating his process continued on my laptop. Not even half a minute after they left, the apartment door opened and my roommate Alex walked back in. I forgot my phone, he explained in a panicked voice. Annoyed, I agreed to help him. I'll check here in the kitchen. Why don't you check your room and the living room? I suggested. Alex hurried to his room without a word. In the meantime, I looked between the half-drunken solo cups and bottles covering the kitchen table and surrounding countertops. If I'm being honest, I was mostly eager to find it so I could have some peace and quiet alone after what just transpired with me and his friends. Unfortunately, neither of us were having any luck. Alex moved to the living room and began checking the couch. After checking the first cushion, he looked up at my laptop screen again. The man in the video was now cutting strips of flesh from what remained of the corpse's torso, and carefully lowering them down into the bucket of blood, organs, and limbs. You still have this on? He muttered disappointed. I have no clue how to turn it off. I don't know what to tell you, man. I replied, a hint of irritation slipping through in my own tone. Alex turned back to the couch and continued to search through the cracks. I was about to look away from the laptop screen and continue searching, but something was off about the video now. The man in the suit was standing still, and his commentary ceased. Thought it might have been lagging due to a poor connection, but the continuous, annoying ambient noise made it known that the audio was still playing. I walked into the living room to get a closer look. When I got close, I spotted some blood still dripping from the corpse into the bucket and could hear their splashes. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up at the realization. The man in the suit was simply standing there too still to notice any movement, though his face was still out of frame. It was obvious he was looking in the direction of the camera. The screen cut to static once again, causing me to flinch and fall back, as I had been mere inches from the screen. The screen cut back to a video, but not the same one. The man in the suit was alone once again in the same room, though no hanging corpse accompanied him this time. He faced the camera, head still too high to be in the frame. My eyes may have been playing tricks on me, but I could have sworn colors started to seep into what was once a black and white video. The dark splotches on the wall behind the man turned red, though color wasn't the only thing that seemed to be changing. The details on the man's suit seemed to become sharper and clearer, and the grainy noise in the background faded. In a matter of seconds, the video quality transitioned from terrible to fantastic. It would seem one of our subjects has decided to join us. The man chimed in after the long silence. His deep, soothing voice now sounded crystal clear. The quality of the audio got better too, but something about it felt off about his voice. The best word I could use to describe it is synthetic.
Like something trying to mimic the sound of a man. Something that didn't get it quite right. Seconds later, the lights above the man turned off and the video went black. Alex stood up excitedly from the other side of the couch holding his phone. Finally, he expressed. I was about to remind him of the Uber and his friends waiting for him downstairs when all the lights in the apartment suddenly went out. We froze, giving a brief moment of silence as we both realized the power must have gone out. That silence was broken by the sound of approaching footsteps from the video before the lower half of the man's face came into view for the first time right in front of the lens. On his unblemished, ceramic-looking face, a grin formed. As his smile widened, his jagged, sharp, asymmetric teeth revealed themselves one by one. In contrast to the rest of the dimly lit and dull picture, his bleeding gums brought color. The sight of the inside of his mouth sent a shiver down my spine, and I tensed up in anticipation of whatever would appear next. To my relief, the video cut once again, this time to black, where it remained. I tried the power button on my laptop, but to no avail. It seemed that my laptop had simply died, but that didn't make any sense. I could have sworn it was at full charge when I first took it out. It should have lasted hours. Dang it, my phone died, Alex said frustrated. I decided to check mine and sure enough, it was dead too. I knew for a fact that the last time I looked at my phone the battery was somewhere in the 80% range. I gotta get down there man, they've been waiting too long. I don't think the elevator is working either. I responded, my voice shakier than I expected. Well, I gotta try it. The only other option is booking it down 19 flights of stairs. He retorted, annoyed as he walked towards the door. I'll come with. I assured and rushed to get my shoes on. A part of me wanted to get to the lobby to figure out what was going on with the power outage. But I think more than anything, being in a dark apartment alone with no electricity or communication, after watching that was the main reason I wanted to go along. When we emerged from our apartment, we were met with nothing but pitch black darkness of the hall. I suppose I should have expected as much. With no windows in the hallway and the power being out, there wasn't anything to light our way to the elevator. Alex and I walked slowly and stuck to the wall, feeling it along the way to the elevator. On the way, our hands passed over a couple of doors to other apartments, which sparked my curiosity as to why we were the only ones who had come out. I had to think everyone else realized the power was out. I imagine some of them had to wonder why that was. Finally, we passed over the door to the stairwell and into the elevator area. We felt around the walls for the buttons, until Alex finally found one and pushed it. Of course, it didn't light up, nor did we hear the elevators moving like we usually could. Alex made his frustration at the idea of missing his ride known. I responded, Looks like stairs are our only option. If you want to make it to your ride, we better get moving. The door to the stairs is right here. I felt around the wall, going back the same way we had come until I found the handle and opened the door. My eyes squinted at the sudden influx of light that flooded the hallway around us from the inside of the stairwell. Of course, the sight of working lights was a welcome one, but how? With the power seemingly out, they were on was a mystery. Alex seemed much more interested in catching up with his friends than pondering that mystery himself. Before I could open my mouth to question the oddity of the situation, Alex moved past me to enter the stairwell and I swiftly followed. I brushed off the lights being on as more than likely emergency power. I followed closely behind as we practically ran down the first few floors, but somewhere around the 14th floor, Alex suddenly halted his descent, as did I. He turned to me but didn't say a word, keeping as quiet as possible as if he were waiting for me to notice something. 
I was about to ask what it was before I felt it myself. The air was cold in there. Very cold. It felt like we were walking into a freezer. When we first entered the stairwell up on the 19th floor, it most certainly wasn't anywhere near as cold as this. I traded a confused look with Alex before either of us could say a word, and we both carried on with our previous pace. As we continued, the air only seemed to grow colder. By the 10th floor, we could see our breath, and although it was cold outside, I knew it wasn't anywhere near this cold. At the 6th floor, Alex once again halted, but this time I watched his eyes grow wide as he stared at something in front of him. He tried to mutter something under his shivering breath, but he failed to make words. I, being disturbed by his sudden state of shock, slowly inched my way down the last few steps of the flight. I was on before peeking around him to get a look. I felt my heart sink to my stomach when I got a glimpse. On the handrail of the stairs hung a meat hook, the end of which was holding up one of Alex's friends through his gaping mouth and coming out through a bloody hole that was once his nose. His frozen eyes looked up desperately in perpetual terror, with blood running down from the end of the hook and his mangled face, soaking his clothes in red. Alex and I must have stood there a whole minute before he finally came to his senses. We... we have to get out of here. Now! He whispered to me. I simply nodded my head and followed him as we walked past his friend's corpse. But we didn't make it much further. When Alex saw down the next flight, he slowly collapsed to the floor and covered his face with his hands. A few more of his friends were presented in the same position, hanging from the handrail on their respective hooks. Seeing more of them on this level gave me the urge to look over the rail, down further. It looked like almost all of Alex's friends who had been in our apartment were now here, dead and hanging. Blood from their faces trickled down slowly though, with as many of them as there were. It collectively painted a dotted pattern on the concrete floor at the bottom of the stairwell. They all looked up at me with the same horrified expression on their faces. The sound of tearing flesh broke my trance and caused me to lean away from the handrail. Though still close enough to see down it, a gloved hand reached out, holding another meat hook, and a body with it. The arm attached to the hand reached out, and effortlessly placed the hook on the opposite handrail. I recognized the style of suit belonging to the impossibly long arm, but couldn't believe my eyes. After placing the hook, the arm froze in place. Then he began to chuckle softly. So, began the synthetic mockery of a man's voice. Our little watcher has come to see how we do it with his own eyes. My heart sank again. He meant me. I turned to Alex and uttered the only word I could find. Run. Alex scrambled to his feet and followed me as we ascended the steps even faster than we had come down. Behind us, I could hear him pursuing us, but at a relaxed pace. Though on the video, nothing about his appearance was rotund. His immense weight was made obvious through the pounding and creaking of the metal stairs. I don't think I've ever run so hard in my life, and I was surprised we made it as far up, as fast as we did. Luckily, I thought, we must have been more than a few levels above him when we returned to the 19th floor, though I had lost track of his steps. I was far more concerned with putting as much distance between him and us as possible. Alex quietly opened and closed the door of the stairwell, and we stuck to the wall, quickly making our way back to our apartment, which I knew was the third door to the left. After entering, we again closed the door quietly, before barricading it with the couch. We stood right by the door waiting. I think we were both thinking of what to do if he found us. But if he did, there was nowhere left to go. 
nothing left we could do. Any minute, I expected to hear the stairwell door open and for his heavy footsteps to come down the hall before bursting open our door. But that never happened. Eventually, we both lowered ourselves and sat on the floor. I think adrenaline was the only thing that saved us, and now it was gone. I felt drained, and Alex was shaking. I couldn't imagine what he was feeling. Only thing I knew we shared was the mix of confusion and fear as to how what we just saw was possible, and what that thing that did it even was. A buzz came from my pocket. Alex raised his head and looked over at me. The buzz came again. I reached in and pulled out my phone. The bright light from its screen was a welcome sight, as was its nearly full battery, though its content again left me puzzled. Who is it? asked Alex in a barely audible whisper. It's 911, I responded as confused as he was. They can do that? They can call you? I lightly shrugged my shoulders in response, unsure myself if it was possible. Alex pulled his phone out as well, but it still wouldn't turn on. I reluctantly answered and raised the phone to my ear. You both need to get out of that apartment now. A woman's voice commanded sternly from the other end. My lips quivered as I searched for a question to ask. Now, she came again, raising her voice. We can't leave. There's something out there looking for us out there. I whispered back. He's not out there anymore. You need to move. Was speculative and questioned the intentions of the person on the other line. For all I knew... She could be working with that thing from the stairwell to send us into a trap before I could contemplate my next move, she spoke again, this time in a calmer tone, as if a final appeal for me to listen to her. He's in your closet. Get out now. A shiver went down my spine. Alex must have heard her too, as he looked at me with a confused look but both our attentions were quickly drawn away to a sliver of light that crawled along the ground and grew on the space of floor between us. We looked up and again exchanged brief looks of confusion before looking at the wall where it was coming from. The doors on the closet containing our washer and dryer were slowly opening, as if being pushed by an ever so slight gust of wind. The narrow gap between them is where the light seeped through. A wave of dread swept over me as Alex and I rose to our feet, like we were ready to run but had nowhere to go. This wouldn't have raised much of an alarm in my head if the woman on the phone hadn't just said what she said, and if I hadn't already known that there wasn't a light in that closet. The doors swung open violently, and our apartment was filled with light, a gloved hand gripped the top of the doorway before an old top hat ducked under it. The suited man entered, crouching to keep his hat from being pressed against the ceiling. He took only two casual steps towards us, but his long legs crossed the distance across the room before we could move. I tripped on my feet trying to keep away, dropping my phone in the process, but Alex was well within reaching distance. In one hand, the man had yet another meat hook, and with the other, he reached out and gripped the top of Alex's head, giving it a quick twist. His face now looked at me from the back of his body with the same terrified expression stuck to it that his friend's corpses had. He flung Alex's corpse over his shoulder and then leaned down towards me on the floor. The light from the inside of the closet cast a shadow on the man's face from the brim of his hat. But the glowing yellow light from his eyes shined through the darkness. His breath was foul, reeking of odor like that of rotten meat when he opened his mouth to speak. As for your little friends there, he said, briefly glancing at my phone on the ground. Wish them good luck for me. He said, followed by another sinister chuckle. 
He turned back towards the closet with Alex still on his shoulder. Inside was not our washer and dryer, but rather a big open room with concrete floors and more bodies hanging from the ceiling. Strung up the same way as the others, a meat hook in through their mouths and out where their noses used to be. And as for you, the man turned back to me again. I think I'll wait for you to fatten up. With his final word, he smiled at me with his jagged, bleeding teeth before carrying Alex in and pulling the doors shut behind him. The light in the closet faded, and the power in the apartment came back. I write this story now because what happened to me up on the mountain is relevant to current goings on. There's a trailhead in Washington that rarely has any cars apart from mine. Nice and private. Eight miles round trip through back country that's gorgeous in spring. I go there alone and often. It is not accessible in winter. It is a moderate hike. The path climbs to just under the tree line where underbrush and the evergreen canopy thin out. There's still snow on the ground in spring. Plenty of bird song and chipmunks and the occasional deer or bear encounter. Apple trees in Wenatchee had begun to flower by the time I made it up there for my first hike of the season. Slight dismay at seeing a big white Ford pickup already parked. It dwarfed my Mini Cooper, made the Ford look intimidating. I gathered my water, snacks, and hiking gear, threw on my pack, tied my boots. Breathing the fresh air, I started the hike. The trail starts in the thick of the woods, and you can still hear cars nearby on Highway 2. The sound fades slowly on a straight shot through a dense forest of tall trees. It was a bright, clear day. Sunbeams looked like spotlights piercing through branches, splotching a collage of UV roar shocks among ferns and needles on the ground. Eventually all you hear are the animals, insects, and your own huffing. When the trail starts to climb is when I drink most of my water. I carry a purifier pump because there are a number of streams I siphon from along the way. After about an hour, there is more sky than canopy, and while it's cold at the elevation, the sun feels hot. It was at this change that I heard it. A muffled bang. It was muffled by a ridge in front of me, but I could hear its echo return a few seconds later from a cliff face across the valley to my left. A gunshot? I thought initially. There weren't supposed to be hunters here. But I wouldn't put it past them. I kept walking. A while later, say 15 minutes or so, I heard another bang. Only this time I had crested the ridge and so I heard it crystal. Loud as a firework. Caused my heart to miss a beat. I even stumbled into a stance to preserve my balance. The echo returned immediately. Raw and coursing. Bang. And I saw it. Smoke in the near distance, rising between two red cedars. Not too far in front of me, but higher toward the tree line. What had it been? Birds went flying in fear. I ducked impulsively. For a minute, my over-functioning imagination suggested maybe it was miners exploding dynamite. This was protected land, but also... miners. This isn't the 19th century. I quieted my mind and pushed on in spite of my misgivings. Having followed the smoke like a signal, I had to go off trail for the last hundred feet or so. I came to a short plateau in a clearing and smelled something I didn't like. It was a stink mixed with burning. And then I saw the deer, or what was left of it. Still steaming, its rib cage exposed and dripping rosy blood. Entrails splattered in the high grass. I approached. It was missing an eye, 
and the other was quite dead. Multiple wounds sliced into the carcass seemingly at random. A landmine? Here? No. Then I heard it. A buzzing like a distant power tool. No, like an electric bee. It didn't take long for the noise to grow loud enough to identify what it was. A drone. A second later, it was hovering above the clearing. I waved at it and gestured my disbelief and incredulity, motioning at the dead deer body, torn and broken, pointless, tragic. All the words you can describe something that died when it didn't have to, and in a so violent way, as its life was a game. You piece of crap, I yelled. I don't know if drones have audio input. I screamed regardless. Of course it had to be the driver of that white Ford pickup piloting the thing. No one else was around. Was he going to collect the meat at least? I didn't care. This was not only inhumane, it was psychotic. I'm shy and quiet, but I was going to read this person the riot act when I got back down. And then I would call the rangers to report the incident. It took me longer than I cared to admit to realize the danger I was in. I had retrieved my phone and started to take photos of the dead deer. Only when I began snapping zoomed in shots of the drone did it dawn on me that a little round object was dangling from its belly, 50 feet in the air. It had moved, and now hovered directly above me. My heart seized. It had moved and was above me. It carried a grenade. All this happened within a minute of discovering the drone. Seconds later, a clink sound, pounding ears, bird song, rustling dry needles beneath my feet as I pivoted and dove. Bang. I was deaf for a moment, only ringing in my ears. Dirt fell everywhere. Metal smell, smoke from the explosion behind me. I checked my body, expecting to be missing a limb all intact. I had dove over the edge of the plateau just in time and so the fragments were absorbed by ground. I was breathing frantically. I scanned the sky, no drone. Scurrying to my feet, I stumbled. Noticed that part of the sole of my boot heel had been sheared clean off. I ran down 100 feet back to the trail, tripping as I went. I was an hour from the trailhead. I began to brisk walk run back. My mind at this point was coming to terms with the incident, but it was unlike any trauma I'd ever experienced before. Thoughts were stunted, came like slaps in the face. Dead deer, drone, grenade, explosion, attempted murder. Why? Killing animals, pointless, psychotic. I hustled for ten minutes, trying to adapt and balance a missing heel by jogging on toes. My ankles were killing me. Then I stopped in my tracks. A faint buzz. I was still close to the tree line. More sky than canopy. Then I saw the drone zip overhead. An involuntary scream escaped me. No. I remember saying aloud. No, no, no. It drew a great U-shape in the distance, circling back toward me. No place to hide. I didn't need to squint to know its belly cargo was another grenade. Dark and menacing, dangling as if thinking itself a gift that I want to receive. My god. It hovered overhead as I sprinted down the trail. I took no effort to keep up. I could see it above leading me, like a sniper leads its moving target. I stopped. It stopped. I began running back the way I'd come, and again it matched me, leading me fifty feet in the air, ten in front of me. I stopped again, panting, trying to catch my breath. It made no difference. This was my angel of death, here to deliver me to oblivion. At no point in that moment did I think of the pilot. It was me against the drone, the machine, the technology and violent concussive power that would take my life in this meaningless way. Like a game, 
A story with no plot, just erased from existence. As I stood, hands on knees panting, I did not let the drone out of my sight. Then it lowered itself down, 40 feet, 30. I looked to my right at a tree, the thickest and closest, and in that instant the drone careened at high speed on an angle directly at me. The buzz was deafening, and just as it reached me, and as I dashed toward the tree, I heard a click sound, a plop. Then the drone banked hard into an ascent, and I ate the dirt on the opposite side of the chosen trunk. Bang. Falling dirt, drizzling fern and common yarrow, like plant rain. It fell onto the back of my head and back, pattering. My hands were dug into earth, grasping loose dirt like a shield. My face as well smashed into the dirt, as if just touching it would put me safely beneath it. I was breathing it even. Tears wet my cheeks, and when the ringing stopped I heard my own voice screaming. But the grenade miraculously missed. I was alive. I got to my knees. No buzzing. The tree trunk was ripped of bark and riddled with shrapnel. I touched it. I might have even thanked it. Was this the day I die? It is difficult to recall what happened after this. I think I achieved runner's high. Already the high altitude makes oxygen scarcer. Add that to the mortal dread. Endless screaming and crying for help as I went. Knees feeling like they would implode. The forest gave me countless gashes as I tripped, fell, got up, and kept running down the trail until I was again obscured by a canopy. I heard the drone buzzing overhead. I couldn't keep track of it and just ran. I heard a loud bang again, and I just kept running. Snot and dirt and tears clogged my senses. I screamed. My body burned. The buzzing grew again ten minutes later. And looking back over my shoulder, I saw it navigating the thick branches of my evergreen protectors. I saw it clip one, and its gimbal stabilizers saving it from falling. That was the last I saw of it. Unable to continue running, I limped for the last 20 minutes through the forest, merging it in an abandoned trailhead. The white pickup was gone. My Mini Cooper sat shining under a Rorschach sunbeam. Heavenly glints. Glints of success. You made it. I sat against the tire, catched my breath. Ringing ears calmed. Pulse slowed. I listened to the bird song around me and nearby cars on Highway 2. This all happened only two days ago. I'm writing this all down because, well, I've already made a police report. Something else has happened. A girl went missing while hiking. They found her car. Not my trailhead, but another one I know of. It's in local news. Hasn't made national yet. I know her. Went to high school with her. They're looking for a white Ford F-150 in connection. Rescue crews are heading up there now. I can't stop thinking about that drone. About how weak and out of control my life felt. How its buzzing pursuit rang like a deafening demand. Submit. Submit to me now. I can't stop thinking about the deer carcass. My god. What are they going to find? I need to share something that happened with me recently, and I'm completely lost. Well, I recently moved to the house where I am, a spacious place with a large backyard. I live in South America, and around here vegetation grows a lot and very fast, so I need to weed the yard weekly if I want to be able to step on the ground. The thing is, this new house had been unoccupied for quite some time. So, you can imagine the scene. I called a friend to help me clear the land, and after five exhausting hours, we managed to make the place more welcoming. 
We were heading inside for a well-deserved lemonade when he tripped and fell. I approached to see how he was, and he turned, looking at what had caused his fall. It was a small rounded piece of metal, I suppose aluminum, sticking out of the ground. With most of it buried, I began to dig to see what might be there. I've seen countless news stories of people finding relics, gold coins, and all sorts of things in their yards, making a decent amount of money. What I found, though, was a chromed tube. It had engraved writing in relief on the metal saying, Photograph Time Capsule. Only open if adding a photo. It may not be a valuable item, but it seemed interesting enough to make me keep it. We went inside, and while refreshing ourselves with juice, we started talking about the capsule. My friend, whom I'll call Franco, is a photography enthusiast and has a Polaroid. You know, those more aesthetic things. He suggested taking a photo to add to the capsule and bury it again somewhere else. It would be an unusual and different artistic project that he would like to participate in. I agreed and while he went to his house to get the camera, I decided to take a peek. The photographs were really old, probably from the 19th century. The first one showed a gentleman with a thick mustache, top hat, and cane posing in profile. In the background, mountains and the sun. It was quite worn, and a layer of blackened mold covered the side of the figure. The other one was of a group of academics, young men in their overcoats posing next to a train with spontaneous smiles, carrying bags hanging at their sides. It was also very old, perhaps from the transition from the 1800s to the 1900s, and still had that layer of mold. I hope Franco knows how to clean photos. It seems like we have an infestation here. However, something bothered me this time. The stains seemed more defined, not like mold spreading. It occupied a space in the photo between the young men. If they were more distant, I might consider it to be one of them. I moved on to the next guy. A guy in a white tank top, military style haircut, a dog tag around his neck. It was at this point that I was sure something was wrong. The mold stain this time was bending over the guy, stopping at his face and falling over his shoulder on the other side, as if passing its arm over him. It just couldn't be natural. The lines that marked it were too defined, too specific. I started feeling uncomfortable with this, like I was being watched. A knock on the door made me jump in fright. Franco's voice came from outside. I rushed to open it, and as I saw him with the camera in hand, I was momentarily blinded by the flash. This one will be great, very spontaneous, he exclaimed. I quickly called him inside and began to explain the situation. At first glance, he seemed skeptical. He said they were just stains and went on a monologue explaining what... Peridolia is and how to seek patterns and shapes where there are none, but when we moved on to the next one, a more recent one from the 1970s, everything changed. The girl posed with her arms up joyful. The lighting came from a bulb on the ceiling, primarily illuminating her, while in the background something lurked. The mold stain now definitely was something. It seemed almost human, but in a way I can't explain. It made our heads ache at the time, and now, when I try to think about it, it starts to hurt again. Yeah, I think you believe me now, huh? I asked. Okay, there's something weird with this. Look, let's stick to the initial plan and bury this thing. He looked again at the photo. Preferably far away from here. I agreed. So, do we have a shovel? He questioned. I did have one, but it broke last month, and I didn't have time to buy a new one. Well, Franco continued, I still have my gardening tools. They're not exactly professional, but they'll do the trick. If you want, I can go get them, and... I interrupted him. 
No way I'm staying here alone. He pondered for a moment. Okay, but we can't leave this thing here alone. Who knows what might happen? Well, then let's take it with us, I suggested. Honestly, I don't know. It's better to leave it here for now, and after we get everything, we take it back and never bring it back again. So give me the keys to your house and you stay here. I won't. The house is mine. Aha. <laughs> I knew you were scared, too. Okay, okay. Let's do this. Rock, paper, scissors. He said this already getting into position. I expertly prepared myself, trying to predict his movements and intentions. Filled my hand and confidently threw scissors. To my misfortune and surprise, Franco lowered his fist unchanged and closed. See? It's the same. I'll be right back, okay? Just start packing the photos so we can get rid of this as quickly as possible. Oh, we'll get rid of this as quickly as possible. I mimicked his voice in a clumsy way as he closed the door. I began to pack the photos into the capsule again, trying not to look too much when suddenly I noticed a photo I hadn't seen before. And then my heart froze. The image showed my face. A withdrawn expression with a sudden flash that illuminated my face. Hands slightly raised towards my face. It was the photo Franco had taken of me. The problem, however, was what was behind me. The stairs are in front of the door and right at the top, facing in the same direction, is the door to my room. And in this image, unlike how I remembered leaving it in the morning, it was open. But that wasn't the worst part. No. In the gap formed between the wood and the wall, I could clearly see something. A face. Twisted and poorly formed, but still a face. It was like the mold stain. Seemed to be made of the same substance. Bug-eyed and reddened eyes just above a crooked and pus-filled mouth. I had been staring at the photo when I heard strange noises upstairs. Footsteps? Suddenly the creaking of the bedroom door. I really don't know what this is. I ran and locked myself in the bathroom. I've heard some strange noises echoing through the house. They come, disappear, come back with no apparent time pattern. It's been more than two hours and Franco hasn't returned. And he doesn't answer my calls or messages. I don't know what these photos are. But there's definitely something very wrong with them. It all started when I was 16. It was Halloween and my friends and I all had a bit too much fun pushing each other to do something dumber and dumber. We'd snatched a bottle of red from my parents' stash and passed it around when one of us came up with the idea to check out the old mall by the freeway. The place had been closed a few years prior, and none of us had been there more than a couple of times as kids. But we figured it could make for a good story. The five of us crammed into a car and made our way out there, blasting music as we went along. Godsmack, P.O.D., P.M.5.K., Head P.E., it was a different time. Rod was up in the front seat trying to smoke something, but the rest of us kept interrupting him. He had this stupid hang-up on a joke where, if you even reminded him of it, he wouldn't stop laughing. It could boil down to a single word and he'd burst. As we got there and poured out on the concrete, a chill passed through me, more so than the autumn air. The pillars outside reminded me of a rib cage, making the whole place look like a giant concrete corpse. In the dark of a Halloween night, pretty much anything can look terrifying. That's just where your mind wanders. We made our way in through a loosely boarded glass door. Stepping inside, all the light we had were our flip phones and the moon slipping in through the skylight. I'd been in that mall a handful of times over the years, but what I was seeing there and then was something different. 
without the people and the ads and the billboards and the stalls, it was just a husk. Something left behind. Still, we found a bunch of stuff. There were still metal racks in the middle of the old clothing stores which we could climb. There was a counter at the old sandwich place where we could pretend to take orders. There were windows to break and these huge empty spaces where our voices would carry all throughout the building. The only place that held some sort of reverence to us was the toy store on the second floor that had once been the center of our attention. We were still just 16. And most of us remembered a time where we would beg our parents for a trip there. It had been the biggest toy store in our world, and there was always something new to look at. But seeing it then and there, it was just as dead as the rest of the place. Not even the sign remained. As the others made their way inside, I split off to take a walk, lighting up the hall with my phone. They mocked me on my way, saying whoever splits off the group is always the first to die in horror movies. Hilarious. I went past what remained of the old stores. The gift shop, the flower boutique, the bookstore. I could almost see them, but only in my mind. Now it was all concrete and cheap sandstone tiling. The place wasn't even old enough to be dusty yet, remaining in this sort of space between living and dead. Like a man on life support, it'd only take the flip of a switch and this whole place would come alive, ready to welcome people back, but of course, that wouldn't happen. Then at the end of the mall, I came to a full stop. It turns out we weren't the first people with the idea to come here. There was a resting area in the far back, a sort of alcove. Benches set around an empty space where stalls were supposed to be all centered around this massive red marble column. I called the others over. They had to see this. My voice easily carried all the way across the mall, and the others came running. Someone had been here. They'd flipped all the benches onto their backs and placed several pots and planters in a circle around the column. Hell, they even planted something. I could see little blue sprouts poking up. But the freakiest thing was the column itself. They'd taken the old mall posters and plastered the thing with them. These posters were just the pictures of a smiling middle-aged woman, dressed in a sort of 50s attire, a generic yellow sundress with little white flowers on it. She also had the most generic stock photo smile you could imagine. To her right, on every poster, was a cartoonish speech bubble. There were just old sayings, bordering on cliches. Like Mama used to make them, the more the merrier, happily ever after. But the freaky thing was not the posters themselves, but what had been done to them. Someone had burned out the eyes, leaving them covered in scorch marks. With the red marble in the back, my brain sort of short-circuited, making me think I was looking into her empty eye sockets. Seeing the gore behind the eyes, it was unsettling and probably intentional. They'd also modified some of the sayings, crossing out certain words. Mama used to, more, ever after. It was unsettling. Some of us caught the Halloween vibe of it, thinking it fit perfectly with what we were up to. Others could sense it, like me. That this wasn't just a fun thing someone did for giggles. This was deranged. It must have taken hours to arrange this sort of scene, and we couldn't imagine a good reason to do it. That's Lady Lockley, said Rod, pointing up at the posters. I had a crush on her. Looks like my babysitter. She's like 50, I added. Still got a great rack. The others agreed. It was funny, but I couldn't bring myself to laugh. This felt like rot. In the same way that a corpse decays, this was the way old buildings decayed. It made me feel filthy like I was some kind of bacteria, infecting this place and breaking it down, corrupting it, digesting it. I felt sorry for Lady Lockley. 
She deserved better. A happily ever after. Once we got bored of wandering around, we made our way back to the entrance on the other side of the building. One of the guys squealed in delight. He'd found a ball pit. Looking at it, it was clear that this thing wasn't sanitary. We could hear something moving in it. Probably rats. Part of the ceiling had collapsed, leaving a dead wire hanging like an open nerve, and the whole place was covered in a thin layer of concrete dust. Someone's gotta go in, they said. We ain't leaving until someone goes in. Not me, I added. No way. And that settled it. I was the first to decline. I had to be the first to go in. No matter if I wanted to or not. The others grabbed me and pushed me into the deep end face first. Plastic balls rattled against my ears. I was fully prepared to be drenched in rat pee and bites. But nothing happened. There was concrete dust covering my scalp and forehead, but apart from that, I was fine. It tickled my nose a bit. The pit was deep enough to reach about halfway up my body, but I'd sunk to the bottom. I could feel the rubber flooring against my cheek. The others were lighting me up with their phones. The lights coming through the balls made a sort of kaleidoscope of pastel colors, stretching the shadows out into long, distorted shapes. As I struggled to regain my balance, I fumbled around with my hands, trying instinctively to grab something. But instead, something grabbed me. It was only a silhouette. A face somewhere in the swirl of colors. The shape of a head with two holes where the eyes were supposed to be. It gasped excitedly. Even from a distance, I could taste the ammonia on its breath. Its icy fingers interlocked with mine wanting to bring me closer. I recoiled, shaking my head. I think I let out a scream, but I don't remember doing it. My pulse shot through the roof as I forced myself back to my feet, scrambling to get back to the others. They were laughing, thinking I was just surprised. As my head breached the surface, they were standing in a half circle shining their lights at me. Of course, there was nothing in the ball pit. I wiped my dusty hair and prepared myself to drag one or two of them down there with me, but something in the air changed. Their faces went from gleeful joy to careful curiosity, to worry. Turning back towards the pit, I could see why. On the side of every ball in the pit was an eye, lovingly hand-painted with a sharpie. The others helped me up and tried to diffuse the tension with puns and jabs. It didn't take long for the chill to leave our spines, but it took me the longest. Looking down at my hand, I felt cold like something had really touched me. Something just as real as that mall and the people who'd invaded it. We left shortly after, taking the car back to town, blasting our music again. We filled the rest of the night with more stolen wine, games, dares, and laughs. But something in me had changed. I couldn't let go of that image of Lady Lockley and the red marble in the back of her head. Through every chuckle and every smile, that feeling held me back. Something had changed. Forever. That night, as I slept on Rod's couch, I watched the moonlight cast a shadow on the opposite wall. The cross of the window shaped the light into four perfect squares. As I lay there, half drunk and half sleeping, I imagined them as little television screens, each showing whatever came to mind. Old memories, dreams, hopes. But every made-up show I imagined always ended the same way, with the mental image of a middle-aged 1950s housewife, her dead smile, a southern drawl, and the red, infected cavity in her skull where her eyes ought to be. The next day, it all felt like a bad dream. Some of the guys were hung over, and most of us just made our way back home to sleep it off. I didn't want to go home. My parents were so focused on my older brother at the time that they didn't even care what I did. He was the one with the problems. I could get away with pretty much anything. Being gone for a day was nothing compared to a heroin addiction. 
Still, I had to get back home. Much like expected, my parents weren't around. They left a note to say there was some leftovers in the fridge and I could call them if I needed something, but that was it. I had never once called them on that number. Making my way up to my room, I stopped. We have these two windows at the top of the staircase with two knobs in the middle. For a moment, I imagined those two knobs as little eyes. I could imagine them blinking. All throughout the day, and the next, this would become a repeating pattern. Two coins on the counter could send a shiver up my spine. The rings of a scissor grip would make me think of those gaping eye sockets. Two soda cans with their pull tab standing at attention brought me the same image. Every combination of two circles, spheres, or rings, it all forced that image back into my head. That joyless smile of Lady Lockley and her icy fingers interlocking with mine bringing me closer. It came to a point where people started to notice. For example, when I had dinner with my parents, they had a beer each. The bottles were right next to one another, and the top of the bottles formed these two holes. It took me a while to notice, but when I did, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It physically made me itch, and I had this intense need to separate them. Once I did, the two of them just looked at me, not a word spoken. I tried to ignore it. I reorganized my space to make sure there was nothing around to remind me, but every now and then there'd be something. It could be something as little as two people passing on the street and their heads reminding me of floating eyeballs. But it got worse. Once, as I stepped out of the shower, I spotted myself in the mirror. Even seeing my own eyes looking back at me sent into the spiraling anxiety. I could imagine myself eyeless, with that infected red cavity in the back of my skull. I could see it. I could see it to the point where I convinced myself that it was true, that I had no eyes to begin with. My eyes would close and I couldn't bring myself to open them. I would try to pry them open with my fingers, kneeling on the cold bathroom tiles, but it wouldn't work. Nothing would. Come on, I'd cry. Come on. But it just wouldn't work. It was so infuriating that I tickled the back of my brain into a joyless smile. The same kind of smile that Lady Lockley wore on those posters. No one else was suffering from this. I had no one to talk to, and no one would understand why I was feeling that way. It was impossible to describe, and to a group of guys who mostly talked about women and games, there wouldn't be much interest in mental health. So I decided I'd do something about it myself. Much like exposure therapy, I had to go back. I was going to tear down every poster, set fire to the ball pit, and prove to myself that there was nothing to fear. I was going to destroy it. And with it, Lady Lockley. I was going to break those icy fingers and stare into her eyeless face, unflinching. I had this crappy moped that I'd saved up for one summer. Enough time had passed for the first Minnesota snow to fall, so I had to be careful not to slip and slide. I loaded up a backpack with all kinds of destructive tools. I didn't even bother to read the note left on the kitchen counter this time. No one else was going to fix me, so I had to do it myself. I kept the wheel steady, feeling the snow slush stain my cheap jeans. Cold water soaking onto my secondhand shoes. By the time I got there, I was shivering. A cold wind had picked up from the overcast, and there was no moonlight to guide me this time. Still, I'd prepared. I had a great flashlight with plenty of spare batteries packed away. My dad had this battery box in the garage full of whatever kind he might possibly need. I brought the whole thing. I made my way inside through the loosely boarded up doors. The place felt warmer, but maybe it was just me being angry. I had this frustration pent up in me, forcing me forward. 
I went past all the hollow shops, the broken benches, the empty planters, and the dry fountain. I climbed up the dead escalator and followed the familiar shops towards the resting area. I could see the red marble column from afar, sticking out like a sore nerve. The posters plastered to it like a band-aid to an open wound. My footsteps echoed as I made my way closer, clutching the flashlight harder. There were little sprouts in the pots and planters now, some with a little blue bud. Others had barely poked through the dirt. One had grown quite tall. There were more posters now. Some had been stuck to the walls. Others lay strewn about on the floor. Someone had been there recently. I could tell. A few chairs from one of the downstairs restaurants had been dragged up there and smashed, forming a kind of plastic half-circle across the floor. It didn't matter to me. This was all going to burn either way. I put down my backpack and brought out a bottle of gasoline. My dad always kept a spare can in the garage, but I didn't want to bring the whole thing, so I just filled up three plastic bottles instead. I unscrewed the top and just started chucking it at the column, tainting the posters. They were made with some kind of plastic that didn't react well to gasoline, making part of the ink melt a little making Lady Lockley smile into a frown and then a garbled mess. I went all around the column, using two of my three bottles. It was messy, and I got a whole lot of it on my clothes. I would have had to wash them when I got back. My parents didn't ask a lot of questions, but if I were to come home drenched in gasoline, they might have something to say. As I finished, I put down my bag again and got a hold of a lighter. One of those with a long neck for lighting fancy candles. I tried to wipe the gasoline off my hands, but doubt was getting to me. I didn't want to set myself on fire. Then again, this place had to die. For a brief moment, I got stuck staring at the posters. Even with the ink melting off, the holes remained. Dozens of empty eye sockets staring back at me. Some with a barely human face attached. Some were relatively unscathed, still carrying the various slogans and sayings of Lady Lockley. There was even a fully intact, happily ever after poster smiling back at me. I put away my flashlight, letting the darkness of the place overwhelm me. The overcast was doing me no favors. I held the lighter up, inched closer, and clicked it. A single light in the dark, but something was wrong. A chill worked its way across my right cheek, making me squint. Then, a breath of air. The light disappeared and my nostrils were assaulted by the sudden smell of ammonia. And right behind me, grazing my cheek was something cold. Something that was gently placing its fingers on my left shoulder inching up towards my neck. I bent down, snatched up my flashlight, and turned around. The cone of light swayed back and forth, finding nothing. As I backed away, my feet were stepping on their own, seemingly out of my control. My lungs felt stiff like I couldn't push any air into them. There were puffs of smoke with every little forced, panting breath. I wasn't alone. I didn't even think about how far I backed up until my back hit the red marble pillar. I just stood there, frozen. I could feel the eyeless holes turning towards me, judging me, waiting for me to turn around. Something was running down my arm. It made its way all the way to my fingers. I looked down only to see fresh I looked down, only to see fresh blood. Droplets formed at the edge of my fingertips, pooling up and dropping to the floor. The back of my head felt wet. Same with the back of my pants and jacket. I carefully stepped away and turned to face the pillar. Blood. It wasn't just red marble. It was bleeding. The gasoline had made the poster slip off falling to the floor one by one, 
Leaving the pillar raw and unprotected, little pools of blood ran across the floor. It was so quiet. Just little tips and taps of drops hitting the floor, mixing with the echoes of my breathing. I could hear the battery in the flashlight rattling as my hands shook from the cold. And in the distance, a hiss. My ears homed in on the sound, a whisper coming from one of the nearby stores. Put them back. I just stood there, trying to comprehend what I was hearing. What was it demanding? Then from another store across the mall, a louder sound. Put it all back. And from a third store, an old fast food kitchen. Put me back. Looking down at the pools of gasoline and blood, mixing with the misshaped plastic posters, I shook my head. I didn't want this anymore. All the anger had turned to fear, and all I wanted was to grab my stuff and leave. I'm... I'm going, I said. I... I won't be back. There was no response. Just like back home, there was no one to listen to me. Maybe I was speaking to an empty room, making up stories in my head. I won't come back, I repeated. This is it. Screw your stupid mall and screw whatever game you think you're playing. I won't. I suddenly choked on my breath. I could see them in the distance, human shapes stepping out of the storefronts, all with the same cheerful yellow dress, the same hair, the same smile. Then something grabbed me. It wasn't like the first time, where icy fingers daintily slipped into my hand, but something violent, angry, nails digging into my scalp grabbing a handful of my hair, forcing me forward with a dead man's cramped grip. I went from standing, to kneeling, to having my face pressed into the floor in a heartbeat. There were more than two hands, maybe four, five. Something heavy pushed against my spine. No. It wasn't just one word. It was a choir. A dozen identical voices speaking as one from across the mall. Two cold fingers touched my eyelids, forcing me to blink. I forced my eyes shut, trying to squint them away. I could barely breathe. I tried moving my head away, shaking the fingers off, but I couldn't. No matter how far back I forced myself, they pushed on until the pain started. This mounting pressure causing bright, painful spots to dance across the inside of my head. It was excruciating. I was panicking, trying to turn, but I couldn't. There was this raw, primal emotion bubbling inside me, forcing me to scream. I begged and pleaded, but it was too late. I'd wronged them, and they were relentless. Had it gone any further? I'd be blind today, maybe dead, but it didn't. I heard distant footsteps approaching and felt the fingers slowly let up. Pressure released from my spine and the hands holding me down loosened their grip. I slowly opened my eyes, blinking away the spots of pain only to see a man. He had a flashlight of his own, casting deep shadows on his wrinkled face. He must have been in his early 60s and was dressed in some kind of maintenance get-up. A janitor, perhaps. He walked up to me as the last hand let go and offered to help me up. I accepted it and got back on my feet. I didn't dare to turn around. I could hear them, feel them, smell the ammonia. Don't do anything stupid, he whispered. Give them a moment. We just stood there. I looked down, trying my best not to bring any attention to myself. At the edge of my vision, I could see flowery yellow dresses shuffled past me, back into the empty storefronts, back into the mall. He patted me on the shoulder and I looked up, 
The last silhouette slipped into an old outlet space, leaving the two of us alone. He got some blood on his hands from touching my shoulder and wiped it off on his legs. He stepped back to pick up something he'd brought. A stack of posters and a toolbox. Walking up to me, he had this almost apologetic look on his face. So she picked you too, he sighed. That makes, what, four of us? Using a bucket and a still working hose in the back, we got enough water and soap to clean the pillar a bit. It had stopped bleeding, coagulated in a way. We ended up putting up new posters, still with the eyes burned out. She likes them this way, he said. The kids always did this to the posters, long before the place closed. She thinks they're supposed to be like this. We spent some time collecting scrap and piling it into a circle around the pillar. That and drawing eyes on various white surfaces. She doesn't have any eyes of her own, so she needs us to give her some. We spent hours just wandering around, touching up the place, watering the plants, cleaning up the gasoline. The Lady Lockleys seemed... calmer. I could see them shuffling about in the back of the stores, catching a reflection of their perfect teeth every now and then. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that any threat to this place would have me swarmed. Do you have to do this? I asked. Like, often? Yeah, he nodded. What happens if you don't? I think you know what happens. At the end of the night, as I left the mall behind, I saw a final swaying flowery dress in the cracks of the wooden boards. Even now, I was being watched, judged, weighed, before the moment I was safe. At first, I went back like once a week. Once I brought ping pong balls and painted eyes on them, they seemed to like that. Another time, I filled up the water fountain. The janitor would return at times, too, bringing freshly printed posters and scrubbing the floor. No wonder it wasn't dusty. I tried to stop going back there, but it would just build this pressure in me. I'd feel her ire. I would start to focus on circles and spheres, and if my body was reminding me that I was being watched, I'd sometimes feel something cold at the edge of my vision. Something icy brushing against my ear. It would put me on edge, as if expecting something to grab me at any moment. For that smile to come out of the dark and become the last thing I ever see. Places like this don't get torn down. The land is dirt cheap, and the effort to break and ship off all the concrete just isn't worth it. It remains here to this day. I would go back every now and then to fix the place up, to make sure she was happy enough to leave me alone. Weeks would turn to months, and over time, they trusted me enough to come back only once every six months or so. I'd make a day out of it. The plants would blossom into these six feet tall, radiant blue sunflowers, and a creeping vine would slither up the side of the marble pillar. She seemed to like the vines. Sometimes there are new people. I don't really know their names, but we can kind of recognize each other at a glance. Some young, some old. We've tried to board the place up to keep people out, but every now and then, somebody gets through. I don't think they all make it out. Some of the things I've seen over the years tell a gruesome story of their own. I'm in my mid-thirties now. I've done this for half my life as a sort of stewardship, a part of my life that I can't share with anyone. I've gotten to know her wants and needs. There is a personality there, an intelligence. Sometimes they can get these strange whims. I once saw one of them trying to break through the loose boards, only to be dragged away by the others. I've seen them gently caress the leaves of the sunflowers. I've seen them dance on tables, 
walk hand in hand down the empty walkways, and once, just staring up at the moon. I think she's like, an immune system. Like something remaining to stop the decay. The building has been closed for decades, but from looking at it, you couldn't tell. Most buildings that have been empty for that long just looks weighed down and worn. But not the Dead Eye Mall. It's still spry and waiting, as if expecting people to come back. And every now and then, they do. But it is a service I perform under th threat of death, and to this day it terrifies me. While I'm not as bothered by circles or rings, I still have this feeling that I should be. Like I shouldn't be normalizing this. I shouldn't have to compromise to something unnatural and otherworldly. But I just don't know what the alternative is. I have this feeling that sooner or later, she'll turn to me, dissatisfied. And that day, she'll interlock her fingers with mine and drag me to a dark place I can't come back from ever after. Four months ago, my mother died peacefully in her sleep at the age of 68. I wasn't exactly heartbroken at her unexpected passing. We had been estranged for over 20 years. I hadn't even seen her since I had left home for the last time bound for college. No phone calls either. Just an occasional Christmas card with a brief, impersonal message passed back and forth. My mother had never been a very warm or nurturing presence as I was growing up. Looking back, I think it probably had something to do with her own difficult childhood as a second-generation Irish immigrant in a large working-class family. There was also her older brother, who had offed himself when she was only ten. We had never gotten along and had clashed often, especially after I entered adolescence probably because of our vastly different personalities. Whereas I had been a cocky, irreverent, laid-back teen, she had been hard-working, stern, cold, and often harsh. After graduating college in 06, the first in my family to finish high school, let alone earn a degree, I had moved to the city to pursue a career. I had never gone back to visit her. Not once. As I was her only close living relative, my father died when I was still very young, and I had been an only child. I inherited my mother's home after she died. It was the same house I had grown up in, and had also been her childhood home, she and my father having bought it from her parents after they got married. I wasn't thrilled about owning the house. I had too many bad memories of it. Also, it was an ugly old place, and always had been. A dilapidated two-story clapboard. Well over a hundred years old, in a low-income neighborhood of similar, decrepit houses. It had probably been a nice place to live at one time. The area where it stood had originally been one of the more upscale parts of the town where I grew up. But that had been before the Great Depression and the area had gone into an economic decline long before I was born. Hell, even before my parents were born. I had no interest in keeping the property, and intended on selling it. But before I did, I decided to make the long overdue trip back home, and take one last look at the place where I had grown up. Not so much out of a sense of nostalgia or familial obligation, I was just curious to see how my mother had spent the last years of her life. And also, I wanted to check the house and see if there was anything I wanted to take with me before it went on the market. My job keeps me pretty busy. So it wasn't until last month, three months after her funeral, that I finally found the time to break away and take a few days off. It was a grey, dreary day, about a week before Thanksgiving, when I finally made the hour-long drive out of the city and back to the town where I had spent my childhood. The old neighborhood hadn't changed much. 
It was still as depressing and impoverished as I remembered. The same shabby houses, same tiny, unkempt lawns, same weedy, cracked sidewalks and bumpy, poorly maintained streets. I parked alongside the curb and got out of my car, taking a moment to stand and regard the house I hadn't laid eyes on in over two decades. It looked even more bleak and squalid than I recalled as a kid. Peeling paint, sagging gutters, crumbling foundation, cracked window panes. Even when compared to its nearly identical rundown neighbors, it somehow stood out in an even sharper contrast like a testament to all the poverty and hopelessness I had experienced living there, everything I had fled to college to escape from, vowing I would never be as poor as my parents had been. Already I regretted having come back. With a sigh, I reluctantly stepped up the walkway to the front door and unlocked it with the key the executor of my mother's will had given me after her funeral. I entered and began to inspect the house. It was remarkably unchanged. At some point my mother had replaced the old analog TV in the living room with a modern flat screen, but apart from that, everything seemed to be exactly the same. Same threadbare furniture, same tacky knickknacks, same faded wallpaper. I went upstairs and walked down the narrow hallway. Pausing at my mother's doorway, dull sunlight filtered in through the shabby curtains, illuminating the gloomy bedroom. I stared at the bare, sagging mattress on the bed where she had died. Her medication still clustered the bedside table. I stood there for a couple minutes, lost in thought, then moved on. I went to my old bedroom next. At some point after I'd moved out, my mother had turned it into a storage room. My bed and dresser were gone, so were the posters that had once decorated my walls, the shelves that had held my high school sports trophies. I wondered briefly if she'd thrown them out or had put them in the attic, now contained spare towels and extra toiletries. The air was musty. I went to the undressed, dusty window and peered out at the drab late autumn afternoon. The house was silent apart from my own breathing. My mother had died alone in this dismal house. The house she, unlike me, had never been able to escape from. The very air felt freighted with bad memories. Nothing good had ever happened here. I finally came home, Mom, I whispered, my voice choking on the final word. I felt the sting of tears in my eyes. Even though I still didn't mourn her as I probably should have, I did feel an overwhelming sense of sorrow and regret that we had never reconciled while there had still been time or had been closer during her last few years. There was nothing here I wanted to keep. I left my former bedroom and went downstairs. I don't know what motivated me to go down into the basement. There was nothing down there that would have interested me. I could just as easily have left the house right then and gone home. Maybe it was just a desire to be thorough. I had already checked out the rest of the house, and once I left, I knew I would never come back. The basement door was in the kitchen, between the refrigerator and the pantry. I opened it, flipped on the light, and descended the creaking wooden steps to the bottom. The basement was located directly beneath the kitchen. It was a small, dank, low-ceilinged room, hardly bigger than a walk-in closet. Rough stone walls and a concrete floor dimly illuminated by a single bare light bulb. It was mostly barren except for the washer and dryer, a shelf full of cleaning supplies, and some old tools cluttering one corner. I looked around with passing curiosity. When I turned to the rear wall, I couldn't help but crack a small smile. Still there. For as long as I could remember, the back wall of the basement had been dominated by a huge canvas mural depicting the black silhouettes of jitterbugging 1950s teenagers dancing against a white background. 
I had no idea why my grandparents, presumably since they had owned the house before my parents, had put it there. Maybe as a lame attempt to add a little cheer to such a dingy place. Whatever the reason, it was still there after all these years, although now it was badly faded, the canvas dirty and mildewed and tattered with age. Still smiling, I started to turn away from the basement and the house. But at the last second, something caught my eye. I approached and crouched down for a closer look, puzzled. The bottom of the old mural had been pulled away from the wall and curled up a few inches over the years, probably due to the dampness of the basement. And what was revealed wasn't bare stone, but wood. Intrigued, I grasped the frayed edge of the mural and pulled it up more. The rotted canvas ripping a little, exposing more wood. For a second, I didn't understand what I was seeing. Then it hit me, and I was stunned. It was a door, a secret hidden door behind the old, tasteless mural for God only knew how many years. A dozen questions rushed through my mind upon this discovery, chiefly among them. Who had hidden this door? Why was it hidden? And most importantly, what was on the other side of it? In a sudden burst of excitement, I unthinkingly seized the mural and pulled it up with all my strength, tearing it completely away from the rear wall of the basement, fully exposing the concealed door. I stood there, transfixed in shock, staring. The door looked ancient. Somehow it appeared even older than the house itself. It was rounded at the top, constructed of thick, heavy slabs of wood bound together with iron bands. There was no knob. Just a large iron pull ring. It looked like a door you'd seen in a medieval castle. An old but still relatively modern looking padlock was fastened to a hasp that secured it to the wall. But what surprised me most of all wasn't so much the door itself but the large manila envelope that had been stapled to it. And carefully printed in faded letters on the envelope was my own name. And a message in big block letters. For the love of God, never open this door. I pulled the manila envelope loose and examined it closely. It didn't look like it had been there any time recently. It seemed to have been there for a long time. Years. Maybe even decades. Maybe since I had been a very young child. I recognized the handwriting as my mother's. There was something inside the envelope. It felt like some kind of document. I looked at the envelope and its ominous warning. For the love of God, never open this door. Then at the mysterious door, the ancient looking, out of place door that had been kept hidden in my childhood home for all this time. Then back at the envelope in my hands, I was utterly baffled. So of course, like the idiot I was, before even opening the envelope to examine its contents, I made opening the door I was explicitly instructed to never open my first priority, notwithstanding the love of the Supreme Being. But really, who could blame me? Who in my position would have been able to withstand the temptation to act in direct opposition to such a grave edict, regardless of the potential consequences? Curiosity killed the cat, right? There was a locked door in my old house that had remained a secret from me my entire life. Obviously it had been kept a secret for a reason. Said reason was almost certainly detailed in whatever my mother had left for me in the envelope. I could have taken the time to look at the contents of the envelope for explanation, but quite frankly, I didn't feel like taking the time to do that. I needed immediate satisfaction. I wanted to solve this enigma in the most direct and prompt manner possible. I needed to open that door. I looked at the padlock. It didn't seem like I would find the key after all this time. And besides, upon closer inspection, I realized the keyhole had been filled with solder. 
making a search of the house a moot point. I looked over at the old, rusty tools cluttering the corner of the basement. I rummaged through them, thinking I might find a crowbar or something I could use to pry off the hasp. Instead, I found something even better. A large bolt cutter. Perfect. I opened the bolt cutters and fastened the blades to the padlock's shackle. With a bit of effort, I was able to snap the padlock. I tossed it aside and grasped the iron pull ring. I had no idea what I was expecting to find on the other side of the door. A wild menagerie of different possibilities flashed through my imagination. Everything from hidden valuables to dead bodies. I had to quell my excitement by reminding myself that this was probably how Geraldo Rivera had felt in the moments before opening Al Capone's hidden vault. I hesitated for a moment, bracing myself for whatever discovery I was about to make, then pulled hard. The door opened with surprising ease given that it had been shut for, well, God only knew how long. The hinges moved smoothly and soundlessly. I pulled it all the way open and stared through the doorway at... Nothing. Nothing but blackness utter blackness. I took out my phone, turned on its flashlight, and aimed it into the darkness, but it illuminated nothing. Thinking the phone's light simply wasn't powerful enough, I rushed back upstairs and frantically searched through the kitchen cabinets and drawers until I found the big four-cell mag lights I remembered from my childhood. A long, heavy flashlight with a powerful beam. I turned it on to test the batteries, saw it worked, then scrambled back into the basement. I shined the light into the doorway, and was perplexed. The flashlight's beam didn't reveal anything in the dark space beyond the threshold. It didn't cast a spotlight circle of brightness upon the rear wall of the secret room, or disclose anything the room might have contained. The beam of light seemed strangely diffused. The beam didn't seem to penetrate the illimitable blackness so much as be absorbed by it. It was like aiming a flashlight at the night sky, as if there was nothing solid for the shaft of light to fix upon. I couldn't make sense of it. What I was seeing was impossible. Standing there, contemplating that Stygian abyss, I had the impression that I was looking upon some vast, lightless space of unknown, enormous proportion. A space that seemed to illogically defy the physical dimensions of my mother's house. I felt a sudden flood of overwhelming, existential dread and horror. Something close to madness. I felt as if I was peering through a doorway into the godless black void of non-existence that must stand beyond the furthest reaches of the universe, a place where nothing was, or ever had been or would be. It was like looking into the mouth of hell. Robert. For a few seconds, I didn't register the voice, thinking perhaps I'd only imagined it, but then it spoke my name again. Robert. It was my mother's voice. I recognized it clearly, even though I hadn't heard it in more than 20 years. My dead mother's voice, whispering my name from the black gulf beyond the doorway. I was galvanized with sudden primal terror, so intense that coherent thought became almost impossible. I began to tremble. I couldn't even breathe. The voice spoke again, faintly as if speaking from a great distance, but unmistakably my late mother's, and the urgent pleading in it was almost unmistakable. Please, Robert, help me. This isn't real. Some part of my mind spoke up, trying to maintain its sanity and make logical sense of what was happening. It cannot be real. You're dreaming. Please, Robert, help me. The disembodied voice beseeched, imploring desperately. Help me, it's so cold and dark in here. 
The voice was trying to coax me through the doorway into the unknown blackness, and with sudden chilling certainty, I understand it was not my mother speaking to me, attempting to lure me to it. Please, Robert. My paralysis snapped. I reached suddenly, compulsively for the door and slammed it shut, blocking out that awful, unnatural darkness. Immediately the voice fell silent. Gasping with a sudden rush of panicked adrenaline, I closed the hasp. My eyes darted around the basement. The padlock was ruined, but I found a screwdriver amidst the old tools and inserted it into the hasp, securing the door. Then I ran upstairs, pausing only long enough to grab the still unopened envelope my mother had addressed to me. I fled the house, leaped into my car and drove away, and I haven't returned since. When I got home about an hour later, I was almost back to normal. I spent most of the return journey in a state of shock, driving my car on autopilot barely aware of my surroundings, until I was only a few miles away from my apartment. Then I had to pull into a gas station as I was struck by a crippling panic attack. I opened the door and thrust my head out just in time to avoid vomiting into my car. Then I just leaned back with my hands over my face, weeping and gasping for 10 minutes, until I had myself more or less back under control. I entered my apartment, shut the door, then sat down on my couch and examined the manila envelope I had found on the hidden basement door. Robert, for the love of God, never open this door. I opened it. It contained a sheaf of musty smelling handwritten pages. I began to read, and, as I read, I began to understand why my mother had kept that door a secret from me all these years, and why she had left me a warning for when I would inevitably discover it. The first page was dated the year I was born. My mother had written this, and left it for me nearly 40 years before, when I had still been an infant. She must have been terrified something might happen to her, or that she wouldn't be present to warn me in the event that I stumbled upon the door while I was still a child. I read, and as I began to feel that familiar cold dread creeping into my body, just as it had when I first opened the door. My mother had been born the year after her parents had immigrated to the U.S. from Ireland. They had bought the old house when she was five having saved up for it several years working their grueling, menial jobs as factory workers. Even then the house had been run down, but it had been cheap, and it was all they could afford, and they had still been grateful to own an actual home of their own, a place they could raise their family instead of the cramped slum apartment they had all been sharing. Three years passed uneventfully in the house, the terror began when my mother was eight. She and her ten-year-old brother had been the youngest of five children, the older three already being adults who had joined their parents in the workforce. As a result, when they weren't in school, they were often alone in the house until the rest of the family got home in the evening. This probably sounds like neglect to you, but bear in mind this was the early 1960s and times were different then. It was her brother who found the door in the basement. At the time, it had been concealed behind a set of shelves that contained old jars of preserves left behind by the previous owner. It was a chilly, windy day in late fall. During their autumn break from school, they had been playing hide-and-seek and he had squeezed into the narrow space between the shelves and the wall, and that was how he had discovered it. When their parents and older siblings got home, he had told them what he had found. Intrigued, their father and her two older brothers had removed the shelves, exposing the door. It had been locked with an ancient brass padlock, one of those round railroad locks like you see in old western films, and didn't look like it had been opened in at least a century. The padlock was so old and corroded that it crumbled to dust when her father gave it a single tug. 
Their father had opened the door, shining a flashlight, taken a single look inside, then immediately slammed the door. My mother wrote that she had never seen her father look so frightened as he had right then, never before and never after. He had sternly told his five children to never open the door or ever go near it again. He had refused to answer any questions and had sent them all to Ben. That night, my mother had heard her parents talking urgently in their bedroom. She had pressed her ear to the wall and listened. She couldn't make out everything they were saying, but she did hear her father say something to her mother about her sister laughing in the dark and buying a new lock at the hardware store tomorrow. She said their voices were low and heated, but it didn't sound like they were fighting. It sounded like they were just scared. My mother was troubled by what her father had said about hearing his sister laughing. Her father had only one sister, who would have been my mother's aunt, but she had died when he was still a child living in Ireland. My mother had been frightened, but her brother had been intrigued. He had wanted to know what his father could have seen or heard on the other side of that door that would have upset him so much. His curiosity overrode the trepidation he may have had. Later that night, after the rest of the family was asleep, he had disobeyed his father's orders. He had gotten up, gone down to the basement, and opened the door. The next morning, my mother had awakened to the sound of my grandmother screaming her husband's name in a panic. Her voice had been coming from the basement. The family had hurried down to the basement. My mother had observed her mother standing over my uncle who was huddled in the corner, shuddering spasmodically. My mother wrote that she never forgot what she saw. She said it haunted her for the rest of her life. Her brother's face was contorted into a grimace of pure, incomprehensible terror, his eyes bulging from their sockets, his teeth bared like a snarling dog's. His hair had turned completely white. His bulging, unblinking eyes were fixed in a direct line of sight with the secret basement door, which was standing wide open on a rectangular of total blackness. He was alive, but in a state of full catatonia, unable to speak or move or react to any stimuli. My grandparents had called an ambulance, and my uncle was rushed to the hospital. My father immediately bought a new padlock and sealed the basement door. My uncle was put in a mental institution. The doctors thought he would never recover. But miraculously, against all expectations, he eventually did. Although it was over a year before he was functional enough to return home. He was never fully the same after that. He was withdrawn and quiet and morose prone to emotional outbursts and panic attacks. He had trouble sleeping and often experienced nightmares and night terrors when he did sleep. He refused to answer any questions about what had happened to him that night and would scream in fits of hysteria if prodded. He absolutely refused to set foot in the basement or even go near the door in the kitchen that led down there. He would become violent if anyone tried to make him. His condition gradually deteriorated over the next year. He lost weight and developed dark rings around his eyes from lack of sleep. He became paranoid and jumped at every sound. My grandparents would have sent him to a psychiatrist if they could have, but they simply couldn't afford it. One night, after bedtime, he broke down crying and finally told my mother what had happened that night almost two years before. When he opened the door, he had heard a voice speaking to him from the darkness, not a scary or a threatening voice. It was a friendly voice, a voice he even recognized. Whose voice? My mother asked him. Captain Kangaroo, my uncle had stammered to her, referencing a popular children's television show from the time that he had been fond of. It was Captain Kangaroo. He spoke to me by name. He told me I could come inside and play with him in the treasure house. 
he had stepped through the dark doorway into the gulf of the unknown. What did you see in there? My mother had anxiously asked him. My uncle had been quiet for several long moments. Tears rolled down his cheeks. My mother could see fear rising in his eyes as he forced the words out. It wasn't the treasure house. It wasn't Captain Kangaroo in there. It... He paused to gulp, then choked out. There are things in there. In the darkness. Things you can see, but can't see. My mother had been confused by that statement. Things you can see, but can't see. But my uncle hadn't, or perhaps couldn't explain it any better than that. Reading those words, I felt a chill envelop my whole body, as if hundreds of ice cubes were being pressed against my skin. Things you can see, but can't see. My uncle told her he had been lost in the darkness with those things, hunted by them, running from them, hiding from them, unable to find the doorway that led back to the basement. It's bigger in there than you think, he said. So much bigger. It's endless in there. Until just by blind chance he had stumbled through it, away from that awful, godless blackness. He told her that he probably hadn't been in there for more than an hour at most, but time is different inside. It felt like he had been trapped in there for many years, perhaps even centuries. My uncle told my mother that he couldn't stand to live with what he had experienced any longer. He said it felt like some part of him had never left that secret basement room, and was still trapped in there for eternity. He had hugged her and kissed her and told her he was sorry, then had left her room. My mother was bewildered and frightened and confused by what he had meant with his final words, I'm sorry. That was the last time she ever saw her brother alive. He had taken his father's straight razor from the bathroom and slit his wrists in his bed that same night. My uncle had been 12 years old. She had never told her parents what her brother had told her the night before he did it. They were already so overwhelmed with grief and horror, she didn't think they could bear it. But they must have suspected his death had something to do with whatever he had experienced in the basement. They had barricaded the door and strictly forbid the rest of their children from ever going down there again. My grandmother had been the only one to enter the basement to do the laundry, and even then she tried to keep her visits as brief as possible. My grandparents wouldn't allow them to talk about my uncle or his death, and even mentioning his name caused them to get slapped, as my mother painfully learned early on. They wanted to forget about him and put the whole terrible ordeal behind them. My mother often wondered why her parents hadn't sold the house and moved them somewhere else for a fresh start, why they had continued to live there after what had happened. She assumed it was probably because of their lack of money. But then, years later, when she was a young woman and married my father, her parents, aging and in failing health, asked her if she and her husband would take the house from them when they died. My mother said that my grandmother didn't so much offer as beg them to live there. My mother couldn't believe her parents would want the house to remain in the family after the loss they had suffered there. But my grandmother had told my mother she couldn't stand the thought of the house falling into someone else's possession. Someone who didn't know about the door in the basement. Someone who might also have children. Reading that, I suddenly understood. Understood everything. I understood why my mother had been so strict and overbearing when I was a child. So overprotective of me. Why she had always been so moody and serious. Why she had continued to live in that gloomy house with its burden of tragedy and painful memories. All of those years, right up until the day she died. I understood why she had hidden the door behind that old mural with a warning in the event that I would someday uncover it after she was gone. She had been guarding that door, guarding the door to prevent some other unfortunate, 
unknowing soul from opening it, and being lured into the darkness by a familiar, trusted voice, as her brother had been. I understood something else. I could never sell that house. I had to keep it in my possession, take up my mother's mantle as its guardian for the rest of my life. There is something in the darkness beyond that old wooden door, something terrible that doesn't belong in our world, something unnatural and unholy, something you can see, but can't see.